I've been asked today to talk about the Quran and the modern world. It is very easy to define the Quran. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The modern world is a lot more difficult to define. The modern world is in reality the Western world and Western concepts. It is spiritually empty. In Alhamdulillah, Nahmaduhu, Wanastainu, Wanastafiru, Wanaudu Bilahi min Shuruhi and Fusina, Women say at Malina, May Yehdihilahu, Fala Mudilla, Wame Yudlil, Fala Hadiella, Wa Shadu and La Ilaha illa Law, Wahdahu. لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله وبعد. We begin by praising Allah. We praise Him. We seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness. We take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can misguide. But whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, no one can guide. And I testify that Allah alone is worthy of worship. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the servant of Allah and his final messenger. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam and my dear brothers and sisters in humanity, I greet you with the Islamic greeting of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and the blessings of Allah be upon all of you. I've been asked today to talk about the Quran and the modern world. So I thought I would start by defining our terms. Number one, the Quran. Number two, the modern world. It is very easy, alhamdulillah, all praises due to Allah, to define the Quran. It is very easy to define the Quran. The Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the uncreated speech of God. This is what Muslims believe and know to be true. That the Quran are the words of the Creator that was revealed to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 1,400 years ago. The Quran is also a miracle. It is the greatest miracle that was given to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was a miracle then and it is a miracle until this day. It is something that defies human ability and it goes against the nature of things. It is something that the creation could never have produced. The Qur'an is something that could only be from Allah, only be from the creator of the heavens and the earth. And one of the miraculous aspects of this Qur'an, of this book, of this book, the Qur'an, is that this book has remained unchanged for 1,400 years since this Qur'an was revealed. It has remained unchanged. Not one single word and not one single letter of the Quran is different today than it was when the time the Prophet 
had left this world, from that day until today, we have the same Qur'an. You can travel anywhere in the world. You could be here in Dubai, you could go to England, you could go to India, you could go to the Philippines, you could go to Siberia, you could go to the furthest part of the east or the west or the north or the south. Any land you go to and any masjid or any place you go to and you pick up this Quran and you will find that all the Muslims everywhere have the same book. It doesn't change by a letter. It doesn't change by a word. And you can go back a hundred years, 200 years, 500 years, 700 years. You can go back and we can go back to the earliest existing manuscripts written in the time of Uthman ibn Affan. And we can compare the Quran that we have today with the Quran from those days and throughout all of those ages and we will find that it is still the same Quran. This is a miracle of this book. And why should it not be when Allah who revealed the Quran, He told us, Inna nahnu nanzalna al-dhikra wa inna lahu al-hafidhun. Verily we have preserved, the, we have revealed, we have sent down, nazalna, we have sent down the reminder, meaning the Quran. This is another name for the Quran. The dhikr, the reminder. And upon us is the preservation of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He prophesied and He said that He will preserve this Quran. And it is exactly how Allah said. It has been preserved until this day. This is one of the miracles of the Quran. And why? Why did Allah preserve the Quran? And not the Injil, and not the Torah, and not the Zabur, and the other scriptures that came before. How is it that Allah allowed only the Quran to be preserved and those other books, those other revelations to be distorted and to be corrupted? The reason for this is because it is only the Quran that Allah intended to be guidance for humanity until the end of time. The Quran is a book of guidance, not only for those people living in Arabia 1,400 years ago. It is not only guidance for them, but it is also guidance for us living in the world today. And it will be guidance for our children and our children's children, and it will remain guidance until Allah lifts up the Qur'an from this earth. It is the last and final revelation. There will be no more books. There will be no more messengers. There will be no more prophets. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is khatam al -nabiyin. He is the seal of the messengers. And after him there will be no more messengers there will be no more and no new religion from god so this religion al-islam this book al-quran is the final guidance that allah has revealed for the benefits and for the mercy of all the worlds this is the quran And my brothers and sisters, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his mercy and his guidance and blessings upon you. The Quran is a book primarily, primarily, the Quran is a book not about this life, but the Quran is primarily a book about the life to come. This book, the Qur'an, is primarily about the Akhirah. Yes, the Qur'an does teach us about how we should live 
in this world. The Quran does teach us about how we should behave to each other. How we should treat our parents, our neighbors, our friends, even our enemies. The Quran does teach us about business transactions, about how we should dress, about what we should eat. It does teach us about the things of this world. But what the Quran teaches us about the things of this world is only in order that we should become successful when we meet Allah on the day of judgment, the day that is promised, the day that is certain, the day about which there is no doubt. The day when every single one of us, from the first to us to the last of us, the men of us and the women of us, the rich of us and the poor of us, all of the human beings will be recreated physically and we will stand on a day of terror, a day of fear, a day that has been described in the Quran. For some people, this day will be like 50,000 years. This is the day of judgment. When every single atom's weight of good that you have done, you will know about it. And every single atom's weight of evil that you have done, you will know about it. And Allah will weigh our deeds in scales. Good deeds and bad deeds. So whoever's scale of deeds is heavy with good will go to paradise, a place of joy, a place of, a place of happiness, a place of bliss. Where we will never get old, we will never get hungry, we will never get thirsty. There will be no backbiting, no slandering, no loose or evil talk. There will be peace, happiness, tranquility, and joy and bliss. But for those people whose evil deeds, whose sins outweigh their good deeds, for them is hellfire, punishment, pain, suffering, terror, fear, a most awful, ghastly and terrible abode. And for those people who reject faith, for those people who turned away from the guidance of Allah, from those people who chose to follow ways other than God's ways. For those who chose to follow a religion other than Allah's religion, they will dwell therein forever and they will never come out. That is why the Prophet ﷺ said, what do I have to do with the things of this world? I am like a traveler on a journey who takes rest underneath the shade of a tree and then continues on his journey. So whatever the Quran tells us about this world and the things of this world, it is only to help you on your journey to Allah. That is all it is about. So when I say this book is a book primarily about the Akhirah, even when the Quran teaches us about the dunya, it is in order to help us to reach the goal that we desire, which is paradise in the akhirah. So that is the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters. How about the modern world? The modern world is a lot more difficult to define. What do we mean by the modern world? Let me briefly discuss the modern world. I would like to discuss it historically, politically and philosophically, and sociologically. Those are the areas I would briefly like to discuss. The modern world. Let us discuss the modern world. Number one, historically. What we call the modern world 
historically has its roots in a rational and intellectual movement in Europe called the Renaissance. That is the root of what we call modernity and the modern world. The Renaissance is a movement that took place in Europe. And by the way, my conclusion, I'm telling you my conclusion before I reach it, but my conclusion is that what is called the modern world is primarily a Western idea. In, in fact, in reality, the modern world is in reality the Western world and Western concepts. And this is what I will show. So the roots of this start in something called the Renaissance. The Renaissance is a movement away from religion. It's a movement primarily away from Christianity, towards a more rational and independent way of thinking. The first principle of the Renaissance and their thinking is that they no longer accept authority. It's a rejection of authority, whether that authority is the Bible or whether that authority is the ancient philosophers like Aristotle and Plato and Socrates. It is a rejection of authority. It is a chance for human beings in their mind to think again and to think freely without being tied down by these old concepts. And something that happens as a consequence of the Renaissance is what is called the Reformation. The Reformation is a movement away from the dominance of the Roman Catholic Church that leads to the creation of Protestantism. That is all part of the modern world and part of modernity. Also linked in with this is something called the Industrial Revolution. And this is very intimately linked with a economic and philosophical concept called capitalism. So what we find is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And with the Industrial Revolution, a huge and unprecedented change takes, pla takes place in terms of human demographics, in terms of human geography, in, in terms of the human social order. It turns the world upside down. And ultimately, of course, what we have is the ascent of science. Science now begins to become almost a new religion itself. Science becomes the authority on everything. Everything has to be justified within the context of science. Even though, by the way, science is actually very limited and science is also very speculative. Most people imagine science is certainty, but it's not. Science is actually speculation. But anyway, science ascends to a very great height in the minds of people. So modernity, basically, or the modern world, is a scientific world, a rational world, and an industrial world. And of course, from the Industrial Revolution, we move to what we have today is the silicon chip revolution, the World Wide Web, the information revolution, and that's part of the modern world that we live in today, which is an extension, really, of what came before it. And with all of this comes something is called globalization. Globalization, we hear this word a lot, globalization. The global village, the world shrinks. We can travel now from England to Australia in 24 hours. That may seem like a long time, and certainly when you're sitting on an airplane for 24 hours, it does seem like a long time. But in fact, it's very short compared to the amount of time you think it used to take, or you know that it used to take a hundred years ago before there were aeroplanes. It used to take weeks, if not months. So the world has shrunk. We can travel across the world. We can communicate with each other with the press of a button. We can talk to our family in another continent. 
With the press of a button on the telephone, it's incredible how the world has shrunk and how we can communicate with each other. And these are some of the amazing and fascinating things about the modern world. So globalization. But in reality, globalization often means also the dominance of Western cultural ideas. Because indeed the whole concept of the modern world, as I repeat, is a largely Western-led idea. And it's dominated by Western ideology. Okay, politically, what are the defining factors of the modern world politically? Of course, the two catchphrases we could talk about are freedom and democracy. Actually, freedom and democracy, if you've listened to my talk about democracy and Islam, you will know that the word democracy and indeed the word freedom are themselves very hard, hard concepts to, to define. If you ask a hundred people what do you mean by freedom and what do you mean by democracy, you'll get a hundred different answers. But what it does mean is by and large that people have been empowered in a way that they have never been before. Ordinary people are empowered in a way that they have not been before. It's the idea that what ordinary people say and what ordinary people believe and what ordinary people want is important. And that is a huge and massive change in the way that the world views the relationship between the ruler and the ruled. So here we have the ideas of democracy and freedom and of course secularism. You couldn't talk about the modern world without talking about the ideas of secularism, the idea of separating political life and religious life. And that is also a very, very dominant theme philosophically and politically in the modern world. Okay, socially. What are the social changes? We've talked about globalization. We talked about the effects of industrialization. The biggest, one of the biggest social changes that has taken place in the modern world is the position of women. How women participate in society has been revolutionized. There is no doubt about that. A whole different approach to looking at women, not as mothers, not as wives, not as daughters and sisters and aunts and grandmothers, but as people who can contribute economically by working and spending and buying, women are now looked at equally along with men as potential contributors to the economy in a direct way in which perhaps they have not been generally looked at in human history before. We will be talking a lot more about that tomorrow in my talk about Muslim women subjugated or liberated. Of course, the other thing that we find about the modern world is mobility. We talked about that, how we can move very easily from place to place. And perhaps also we could argue that there is an unprecedented level of prosperity. There is still poverty, there is still starvation, but there is an unprecedented level of prosperity and availability to food and many, many different services that were not there before. But one thing you might have noticed in my very short and brief conclusion and summary of the contents of the modern world and the things that might define the modern world is there's nothing to do with the akhirah. In fact, there's not a single thing that we could talk about that defines or fits in the broad definition of spirituality. In fact, one of the defining characteristics of the modern world is that it is spiritually empty. The, the entire focus of modernity, the entire focus of the modern world is on the dunya. It's on the world and the things of this world. 
and in becoming economically prosperous, becoming politically strong. These are the fundamental concepts that dominate the modern world. And so what we find, of course, especially in the West, is a spiritual vacuum. Christianity, if you remember, in the Renaissance, in fact, is largely put aside. The Reformation saves aspects of Christianity, and that's why, by the way, America is still very strongly Christian. They're, they're largely Protestant. But actually, what we find in the Western world is this search for spirituality. And that is why many people, including myself, I am a product of the modern world. In fact, pretty much everything we're talking about here, my brothers and sisters, is a description of the sort of person I was and the sort of world I belonged to before I became Muslim. Do I still belong to that world? Here is the essential question. Because I offer myself here as a type of comparison. In fact, I think I represent in some way an answer to this question or this issue of the Quran and the modern world. Is the Quran, how people ask, how can a book 1,400 years old be relevant in the modern world? What has a religion born in the desert how can a religion born in the desert have anything to do with modern life? You people, they say, you, are hang you live in the Middle Ages. You live in the Dark Ages. These are the sorts of things that we constantly hear. This accusation concerning us and our religion and our way of life. Yet these same people themselves we find as a society are spiritually bereft. And that is why they go on these journeys, as I did, looking through different religions. Hinduism, spirituality, yoga, Buddhism, Taoism, different philosophies, different sects within Christianity. Searching for this and searching for that, going here and going there, looking everywhere they can, trying to find some answers to a question, a question that everyone has. Is this it? Is that it? Really? Do I just go to school and get good grades so I can get a good job? so I can earn lots of money, so I can afford to send my children back to a very good school so that they can work really hard and they can get, get, get good grades so they can get a good job so that they can earn enough money to send their children back. Is that it? Is that the meaning of life? Is that the purpose of our existence? And you find these people they spend their life running, earning money, building their empires for themselves. And they reach a certain age when they have the car, the house, they have all of these things, yet they don't find they're any more happy. They don't find they're happy. They don't find peace. They don't find happiness. Their life feels just as empty as it was before. And that's the problem. You see, the whole of the modern world is built upon a lie. It's built upon a lie. The lie is that wealth equals happiness. The lie is that material Success is the true success. That is the lie. 
And it's not that Islam is inviting us to poverty. No. But the Quran is telling us that the true meaning of life is something much deeper. The true meaning of life is something much more significant. That your stay on this earth is just a moment of a day. And whatever you build for yourself, whatever you accumulate for yourself, whatever wealth that you have, you will leave it all behind. None of it will go with you to your grave. Think about these verses of the Quran, my dear brothers and sisters. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-Hakam al-Takathur. Hatta zultamul maqabir. Kalla sawfa ta'alamun. Thumma kalla sawfa ta'alamun. Kalla law ta'alamun ilm al-yakin. La tarawunna al-jahim. ثم لا ترونها عين اليقين ثم لا تصلون يوم إذ عين النعيم الحاكم التكاثر the worldly life distracts you حتى زلتم المقابر until you reach the grave قل سوف تعلمون then you will come to know. Then again, moreover, definitely you will come to know. Then you will come to know with the knowledge of certainty, definite knowledge. You will have no doubts. What are you going to know, brothers and sisters? The reality of Jaheen, the hellfire, the punishment of Allah, the chastisement of Allah. You're going to know it with the certainty of vision, brothers and sisters, because you're going to see it. You're going to see it with your eyes. You will see Malik al Mawt come to take your soul. You will see him with your eyes. And when you are in your grave, and the, and the window is opened, you will see the hellfire. And the smell will come if you have died outside the guidance of God's guidance. You will smell its smell and you will feel its heat. You will see it for sure. Then you will know. You will be asked, we will be asked about the luxuries, the things we took delight in, the things we enjoyed from this dunya. You know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He was so hungry. One day he was so hungry. He was so hungry that he left his house looking for something to eat. And on the street he met Abu Bakr and he met Omar. They said, why have you left your house? They said, hunger. They said, me, it was the same thing. I left from hunger. So they went to the house of such and such companion. And the companion slaughtered for them a goat or a sheep. And they ate. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Allah will ask you about this bounty on the Day of Judgment. How is it, my brothers and sisters, when we eat in front of us five, six, seven, eight different dishes of foods, 